from World News Tonight. Emotional farewell. A touching goodbye at the diplomacy table as Angela Merkel bids adieu. Political letdown. Joe Biden battles steep popularity drops amid a major party division. Equality struggles. Afghanistan on track for calamity as girls are forced home from schools. Walk of fashion. Gucci basks in the Hollywood glow as stars struck the love parade. From the global resources of the Verna Media Network, this is Other Verna World News Tonight. Now reporting from Studio 24 in Colombo, here's Anuradhi Wickramasinghe. Good evening and thank you for joining us on World News Tonight. On today's coverage, we start off with an emotional farewell in the European Union. French President Emmanuel Macron gave Germany's outgoing Chancellor Angela Merkel an affectionate and stylish send-off, praising her for keeping Europe united through years of crisis. This was a trip not centred on politics or crises, but rather a heartfelt send-off, not just from the French president, but well-wishers who turned out in the wine-growing Burgundy region. It's a wonderful friendship with France, and the president took me today to a wonderful place where you can really discover France as it is outside Paris. Angela Merkel has seen four French presidents in the job over her own time in power and forged a bond with all, from the fallout of the 2008 financial meltdown to the coronavirus pandemic, another major crisis and one for which Emmanuel Macron was glad to have a steady partner. Something he expressed as he awarded Merkel France's highest honour, the Grand Cross of the Legion of Honour. I think we've shaken a lot of things up. And over these last few years, we've done a lot for Europe. Thank you for your patience and your indulgence towards me. But more so, thank you so much, dear Angela, for everything you've done for our Europe. Merkel's expected to step down in the weeks ahead once a new coalition is agreed on. She'd bowed out of standing for a fifth consecutive term in recent elections. U.S. President Joe Biden confronted a sobering defeat for Democrats in Virginia's gubernatorial election, adding new pressure to resolve Democratic bickering. U.S. Democratic President Joe Biden returned to Washington and met the stiffest political headwinds he's yet faced in office. The latest gut punch, a demoralizing defeat for Democrats in Virginia, where Republican candidate Glenn Youngkin won a governor's race. God bless the Commonwealth of Virginia, and let's go. It's a stinging upset for Biden, who campaigned repeatedly for Democrat Terry McAuliffe. Republicans cheered the victory, which could offer a roadmap for the party to retake one or both chambers of Congress next year. Virginia's results suggest that independents and moderates who voted en masse for Biden in 2020 were warming to Republicans once again. Republican congressional campaigns may follow Youngkin's model of focusing on culture wars over race and education and promising to give parents more control over public schools. We know it's wrong, and so on day one, I will ban critical race theory from being in our schools. More tough news for Biden's party in New Jersey, where a Republican challenger seems to have almost overtaken incumbent Democrat Phil Murphy, even though registered Democratic voters outnumber Republicans there by more than one million. We're going to wait for every vote to be counted, and that's how our democracy works. Murphy's narrow lead highlights the surging enthusiasm of Republican voters. That sentiment could spook Democrats in Congress as they wrangle over details of Biden's agenda. Progressive Democrats have threatened to sink a $1 trillion bipartisan infrastructure package unless their priorities are met in a larger spending bill. But moderates, such as West Virginia Senator Joe Manchin, have dug in their heels over the size and scope. The Republican turnout on Tuesday turns up the pressure on Biden and his party to show they can deliver results, but it's not clear whether they will unite to do so. A European Parliament delegation arrived in Taiwan to discuss the self-ruled island's experience in fighting disinformation and foreign interference in its democracy, media, culture and education. For more on this, we have other there in the World News Special Correspondent Prashani Rodrigo reporting from Helsinki in Finland. Prashani. Yes, Anuradhi. Taiwan's Ministry of Foreign Affairs welcomed the seven-member group describing it as the first official delegation dispatched by the European Parliament to Taiwan in history, which is of great significance. 
The legislator's visit comes amid concerns in the European Union over alleged attempts by China to influence European politics and sow misinformation about the COVID-19 pandemic. Taiwan, which Beijing views as a breakaway province, says it too is a regular victim of Chinese disinformation campaigns and the European Parliament had recently praised the island's success in addressing interference in its democracy without restricting freedom of speech and media. The delegation, led by French Member of European Parliament Raphael Glucksmann, said it will discuss Taiwanese experiences in the fight against disinformation, attempts at interference in Taiwanese democracy, media, culture and education, as well as Taiwan's efforts to reinforce the cyber resilience. In a statement before his departure, Glucksmann added, the experience of Taiwan in addressing repeated and sophisticated attacks through the mobilization of its whole society and without restricting its unique its democracy is unique. Back to you, Anradi. All right, thank you. That was other than the World News Special Correspondent Prashani Rodrigo reporting from Helsinki in Finland. Further on Europe, the EU said in a statement that nuclear talks between world powers and Tehran on reviving the Iran nuclear deal will resume in Vienna on the 29th of November. It's back to the negotiating table in Vienna in an attempt to revive the Iranian nuclear deal. The European Union's foreign policy chief, Joseph Borrell, announced the delegations will be meeting on the 29th of November as confirmed shortly after by Iran's chief negotiator Ali Bagheri, who hopes it will lead to the lifting of sanctions imposed on the country. Representatives from the United States, Iran, Great Britain, China, France, Germany and Russia will convene to the meeting, chaired by Enrique Mora on behalf of Burrell. A decision welcomed by the United States, which indicated it's willing to rejoin the deal if Iran is, quote, serious. This window of opportunity will not uh, be open forever, especially if Iran continues to take uh, provocative uh, nuclear steps. And together with the IAEA, we've expressed our concern uh, about a number uh, of those steps in recent days uh, in recent weeks. So we certainly hope that when the Iranian delegation returns to Vienna later this month, uh, they do so ready to negotiate. When he left the deal in 2018, former U.S. President Donald Trump reimposed sanctions on the country, leading Tehran to once again accelerate its nuclear program. Recent discussions came to a standstill after the election of Iran's hardline president, Ebrahim Raisi, in June. He's expected to take a tough approach when the talks finally resume in Vienna. As climate change triggers deadly heat waves, droughts and floods, three UN agencies will begin to introduce funding plans to develop weather forecasting capabilities in vulnerable countries. The United Nations has announced that it's rolling out funding plans to improve weather forecasting in vulnerable countries to further protect them from climate change, including 75 small island nations and least developed countries. The announcement was made at the big climate conference happening in Glasgow, COP26. The countries targeted by the initiative have done little to cause the climate crisis, but face the biggest and costliest impacts as climate change triggers deadly heat waves, droughts and floods. The World Meteorological Organization said weather-related disaster have increased fivefold over the last 50 years and more than 91% of the associated deaths have occurred in developing countries. The initiative aims to plug gaps in weather monitoring and data collection so developing countries can better prepare for climate-related disasters. For example, in recent years, weather data for Africa has declined as readings from weather balloons equipped with observation equipment decreased by about half between 2015 to 2020. Let's go in for a short commercial break. More world news on the other side. Welcome back. Countless numbers of Afghan women are yet to be given the green light to continue with their educational journey, with the guarantees made by the Taliban once coming into power now seeming to be empty promises. 17-year-old Saha looks round her old, empty classroom. The Afghan teenager dreams of becoming an engineer. 
but for now at least, she has to learn at home. Like hundreds of thousands of other Afghan girls and young women, she has not been allowed to return to her studies since the Taliban seized power in mid-August. The hardline group has only allowed boys and younger girls back to class. Across town, Hawa's dreams are also on hold. The university student has not been able to return to her studies of Russian literature. Most public universities are not functioning at all, or only partially. On top of this, weeks after taking power, the Taliban closed the women's ministry, replacing it with a ministry for virtue and vice. Hawa says she has no hope for the future. When Taliban Islamists were in power from 1996 to 2001, girls were not allowed to attend school and women were banned from work. Officials have tried to assure Afghans and foreign donors that people's rights will be honoured this time round. They've promised to allow girls to go to school and women to study and work once details on how to do so in accordance with Islamic law are worked out. They have also blamed the international community for cutting off aid, making it harder to fund the reopening of schools and universities for all. But this is of little solace to Saha, who is stuck at home frustrated and worried about what future lies ahead. The UN rights chief slammed the extreme brutality of the year-long war in Ethiopia's Tigray region, voicing alarm that a recent state of emergency would inflame the situation. Speaking in Geneva, Michel Bachelet insisted on the need to bring to justice perpetrators of a vast array of rights abuses, including horrific killings and the gang rape of mothers in front of their children. It paints a bleak picture, pointing to summary executions, torture, forced displacement and rape by all sides since war broke out a year ago in Ethiopia's Tigray region. A joint UN-Ethiopian report details abuses from the start of the conflict to June, as Tigrayan forces fought against the Ethiopian military and its allies, including soldiers from neighboring Eritrea. During this period, all parties to the Tigray conflict have committed violations of international human rights, humanitarian and refugee law. Some of this may amount to war crimes and crimes against humanity. The Ethiopian Prime Minister said he accepted the report despite some serious reservations, but highlighted that the findings didn't support allegations of genocide. The UN rights chief, though, said more investigation was needed into these claims, as investigators were hampered by authorities' intimidation and restrictions. The government of Ethiopia, as has assured us that national institutions have begun investigations and prosecutions, with some perpetrators already reportedly convicted and sentenced. There is, however, a troubling lack of transparency. The report comes a day after the government declared a state of emergency and called on residents of Addis Ababa to prepare to defend the capital as Tigrayan rebels advanced southwards. A Tigrayan forces spokesman said the measures amounted to a carte blanche to jail or kill Tigrayans at will. The conflict has already left about 400,000 people facing famine, killed thousands of civilians and forced more than 2.5 million people to flee their homes. We have some good news for you. The rollout finally begins for 5 to 11-year-old children as Pfizer doses are now administered to some 28 million kids across America. Despite the enthusiasm of most, some parents still remain hesitant. Seven-year-old Gael Correas on Wednesday became one of the first kids under age 11 to be vaccinated against COVID-19. As the U.S. began inoculating children aged 5 to 11 one day after the CDC recommended the Pfizer-BioNTech shot for broad use in that group, opening up eligibility to some 28 million kids. It's a third of the strength of the dose given to adolescents and adults and offers protection from the highly contagious Delta variant. For many, it couldn't come soon enough. Since the start of the pandemic, nearly 2 million kids in the U.S. under age 12 have been diagnosed with COVID, says pediatric emergency doctor Matthew Harris. The Pfizer vaccine is shown to be more than 90 percent effective at preventing symptomatic infection in children, bringing with it the hope of fewer quarantines or school closures and more normal activities and freedoms. Still, it remains unclear how many parents will jump at the chance. Even many who have been vaccinated themselves are more divided over whether to vaccinate their own younger children, given that severe COVID is much less common for them. Dr. Harris empathizes, but calls Pfizer's research impressive. 
California has mandated school-aged children get vaccinated once their age group is eligible, a measure being considered in New York and Washington state. The Biden administration announced it is putting new export limits on Israel's NSO Group, the world's most infamous hacker-for-hire company, saying its tools have been used to conduct transnational repression. For Washington, it's a means to put human rights back at the center of U.S. foreign policy. It's cracking down on digital tools that can be used for spying and repression, adding four companies to a trade blacklist that restricts any U.S. exports to them, including information or technology. The United States is committed to aggressively using export controls to hold companies accountable that develop, traffic, or use technologies to conduct malicious activities that threaten the cybersecurity of members of civil society, dissidents, government officials, and organizations here and abroad. The four firms, Israel's NSO Group and Kandiru, Positive Technologies from Russia, and Computer Security Initiative Consultancy in Singapore. The Russian firm saw U.S. sanctions applied earlier this year for allegedly providing support to that nation's security services, something it denies. The other companies are accused of providing software tools to help with either surveillance or spying. NSO Group, though, is behind the Pegasus software that's given anyone who wants it top-shelf espionage abilities on a bottom-shelf budget, turning Target's mobile phones into spying platforms without their knowledge. NSO, for its part, says its tools support U.S. security interests by fighting terrorism and crime and is set to appeal. We have the world's most rigorous compliance and human rights programs that are based on the American values we deeply share, which already resulted in multiple terminations of contacts with government agencies that misused our products. The company's addition to the U.S. blacklist could have wider implications for them too, with other firms now maybe needing to think twice before doing business with them for fear of violating regulations. North Korea appears to be stressing the importance of bolstering its internal solidarity as well as loyalty to Kim Jong-un. This seems to be an attempt to further strengthen his leadership under the slogan of Kim Jong-unism. North Korea appears to be emphasizing internal solidarity centered around its leader Kim Jong-un, apparently to firmly establish so-called Kim Jong-unism. The Workers' Party's newspaper Dodong Shinmun on Wednesday highlighted the need to get the North's economy on the right track so that it is not affected by any external influence. It also stressed the importance of internal unity to build a, quote, socialist powerhouse. The paper called for unity and loyalty for Kim Jong-un and the firm establishment of his leadership. North Korea has recently been emphasizing Kim Jong-unism to replace his predecessor's ideologies, marking 10 years of his rule. At the same time, the newspaper urged readers to reject any monopoly by institutions and selfism to overcome economic difficulties of the people. This is in line with Kim Jong-un's earlier remarks at the Workers' Party's plenary meeting in February, which strongly warned against an economic monopoly by certain powerful groups. Welcome back. For more news, let's take you around the world in a minute. South Korea's top office has said that North Korean leader Kim Jong-un's mentioning of an end-of-war declaration is meaningful. Speaking to the presidential press corps in Budapest, a senior Blue House official said that it was the first time Kim mentioned it externally. The U.S. Department of Defense reports that China's objectives for the Korean Peninsula include keeping U.S. troops away from its border. In the annual report on China's military, the department indicated that Beijing's focus on maintaining stability on the Korean Peninsula involves preventing North Korea's collapse and military conflict on the peninsula. Israel's parliament approved the 2021 national budget with Prime Minister Naftali Bennett's government meeting a deadline for its passage and averting the threat of a new election. Poland, Vietnam, Chile and other countries will pledge to phase out coal fuel power generation and stop building new plants. In a deal the COP26 summit's British host said would commit 190 nations to quit the fuel. Air quality levels in India's capital New Delhi were classed as very poor ahead of a day of Diwali celebrations. Experts said the pollution levels are expected to dip further to severe category in the Indian capital. And finally tonight, Italian fashion house Gucci took over Hollywood's Walk of Fame for its latest fashion show, Gucci Love Parade. 
The label transforms several blocks of the iconic Hollywood Boulevard, allowing front row guests like Salma Hayek, Miley Cyrus, Serena Williams and Gwyneth Paltrow to mingle freely in the street. But the celebrities weren't just spectators. Some, like Jared Leto and Macaulay Culkin, acted as models for designer Alessandro Michel's latest collection. Taking inspiration from Hollywood, female models wore classic award show dresses, while many of the male models wore extravagant dinner jackets. There was an abundance of faux fur, ruffled feathers and varying shades of pink as male and female models strutted over the stars on the Hollywood Walk of Fame. Other guests included Diane Keaton, Lizzo, James Corden, Kobe Bryant's wife Vanessa and her daughter Natalia. In case you've missed any of the stories we aired tonight, you can rewatch by catching us on our YouTube page, youtube.com slash English. And that's all the news we have for you tonight. Join us again tomorrow for another edition of World News. I'm Anradhi Vikramasinghe. Until then, stay safe and have a great night.